it is absolutely apt um, that we are here today tackling one of the greatest issues of our time, the greatest issue uh, of all of our lifetimes, uh, the greatest opportunity as well, uh, and I'll come on to that, uh, but doing so side by side with one of our longest uh, and greatest allies. Uh, and a key thrust of this government has been to renew uh, and forge even deeper and greater links. Um, and so just as we will tackle so many of the world's challenges together, uh, so too will we go forward uh, and tackle climate uh, with, with all of you. Um, and you'll, you'll know, this is a sophisticated audience, so you'll know that uh, we stand at the absolute uh, cusp of an intense few weeks. Uh, incredibly high stakes, incredible opportunity and jeopardy to make sure that we get the climate summit um, that concludes, if in a way, the work that we've already started at the G7 summit under the UK presidency. And again, I was delighted that Australia uh, and your prime minister are both going to be at the climate summit and were able to participate uh, in the G7 in Cornwall. So we have a real opportunity to achieve lasting change, something I know uh, many people here have been focused on for such a long period of time. Many people have devoted uh, their careers to this noble uh, and important cause. The UK government has, I think, led the way. It's blazed a trail with the sort of ambition that's required to make the change we need to see. Uh, and again, I know uh, from reading the participants who are here today that many of you too have set your own uh, aggressive and ambitious targets, and that's the right thing to do. So our target is to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 78% by 2035 compared to 1990 levels. And that's just, that's just one aspect of the UK's uh, own ambitions. Uh, it includes ambitions on oceans, to save the world's oceans, to take the interventions that we need, um, and to improve biodiversity. And behind that, we are putting our money where our mouth is, uh, with 12 billion of capital uh, devoted just to international climate finance alone on top of the other contribution that we make. But we're here today not as a group of world leaders, but as a group of leaders in business and investment. And whilst it's absolutely imperative that our global leaders, drawn from every corner of the globe, make a difference when they come to Glasgow in just over two weeks' time, when the pictures have been taken and the flags have been put away and the deck chairs folded up, it is actually private capital, business, entrepreneurship and risk taking that is going to make the difference. It's that that's going to unleash the activity that's going to genuinely make a difference. So it's particularly pertinent that we're all here today and one of my key roles for the Prime Minister as the net zero business champion is to unleash that private sector capability and capital on the climate agenda. We know that this is something that will not only make businesses more sustainable, less exposed to the sort of shocks that we see in the system, and that will sadly become all too uh, familiar part of the firm and going forward, but also that we can grow our top line, that more and more consumers and every part of the supply chain is now focused on climate. And there's a vast opportunity as well for first movers, both at the country level, but at the individual business level. Thousands of billion and trillion pound companies will be created. And many of those that we regard today as giants of the firmament will fade away. It's a genuine revolution. It is the new industrial revolution. Uh, it'll take decades, hopefully, rather than centuries, but it's going to see a, a, a reign of creative destruction, the like of which that we've not seen. And out of that will come renewal, and out of that will come great opportunities. So new forms of clean energy, 
such as fusion sitting alongside those that may be dominant today, but will have a lesser role uh, in the future. Transportation systems that will be reinvented. Zero carbon aviation, we call it jet zero. Autonomous, hydrogen powered ships, radically different urban transport, radically different urban landscapes and cities, new ways of living, and proper circular economies for the first time in so many of the valuable commodities that the earth yields up to us and in which Australia is particularly abundant. Every day I encounter the investors, the entrepreneurs, the business leaders who are making this a reality. My sometimes slightly bullish assessment is that all of the technologies that we need, that mankind needs to solve this problem, already exist. Many of them perhaps in labs, certainly few of them at the sort of scale that we need to erode the cost differential and to deploy them on an affordable basis. And that's not just in the developed world, but also in the developing world. And again, we should look at that, that two billion people rising up in Africa and in the South as a great new market opportunity for all of our existing economies to make the most of. Now, at EUK, we've made a legal commitment. We've made the highest form of commitment that any government can make. And we've done so with political consensus to be net zero as a country by 2050. That's the law of the land. And over the last few weeks, you've seen a veritable cacophony of government strategies, putting flesh on the bones, the, the, the clothes on the architecture of how we're going to do that. The net zero strategy, the buildings and heating strategy, the energy white paper, a hydrogen strategy. It's, all this, it's almost Dickensian in the way we publish it uh, by installments, but you're starting to see visions turn into strategies and strategies into plans. And that's where all of you come in, because you can take those plans, you can take those ambitions, and in a way that governments simply can't, you can mobilize, you can deploy capital, you can take risk, and you can make a reality of those for consumers uh, and for the supply chain. Together, that set of documents that we've published, other countries will publish, COP26, I hope, will ratify and make uh, more bold pledges that will expand not just for this territory, but across the whole world, add up to the demand curves for these new industries that we're going to create. A very clear direction of travel. Nobody's talking about whether or if. People are talking about when and how. And that's how revolutions happen. That's how we translate that into on the ground reality. So the actions of business are absolutely central to that. And I know that businesses, including in Australia, but also in the United Kingdom, are coming forward with their own net zero ambitions, their own commitments. The highest form of standard I encourage everybody to get on board with is what's called the Race to Zero, the initiative that supports science-based targets compatible with one and a half degrees. And that is absolutely, I believe, doable for every large business. The first step is normally the hardest. And two things happen thereafter. One is that business leaders, perhaps tentatively, perhaps cautiously, take that first step and are often surprised by the degree of acclaim, particularly within their organizations, particularly the younger generation. But secondly, once you've articulated that goal in the way that the ferocious problem-solving business delivers for customers every day, it becomes a tractable objective. And the supply chain director and the manufacturing director and the director of sales and all of the wonderful people in your organizations start doing what they do brilliantly, which is breaking those big goals down and solving the problem and making a reality. So it's been my experience, uh, colloquially, with two things talking to chief execs. One is that that first step is often a slightly timorous one met by a wall of acclaim and positivity. But secondly, having first set a goal, and if that goal needs to be slightly further in the distance, it's still worth setting. And then most people come back and say, well, 
we've done a bit more work and we've mapped out and we've got some more data and we think we can actually get there a lot quicker, Andrew. And we will, and we will get there a lot quicker. So I'll conclude by saying this is, we're at the dawn of a great opportunity. We're going to see a revolution and revolutions are to be embraced. I don't mean that in a constitutional sense, uh, but in the sense of the dynamism of business and the opportunities for all of us that it throws up. They disrupt the status quo and they create opportunities for change. And that's how the whole story of the advancement of humankind has happened. From the deployment of private capital, from people taking risk, we've extended the length of the human lifespan, we've lifted billions of people out of poverty, and the fact that we are all here today is a result of that combination of governments working together, setting ambitious goals, discovering a vaccine, backing many horses, but jumping on the one that looks like it's going to win, and then being able to deploy that at scale. We're all each other's leader, and we're all each other's keeper on climate.